My students love getting the right answers. They think it's an integral part of their jobs and why they're in law school. Come on, let's face it. Don't we all love being right, right? Well, it's a sad thing when they have to walk through my classroom door because I have to break them of this idea. No, they're not really here to get the right answers. And it's a somber day when I have to break the news to them because the alternative points to an experience that is much, much difficult, much more difficult, but in the long run, even though they don't know it now, much better than they had realized. Lawyering is difficult. The art of lawyering, that is, it's complex. And sometimes a case may have so many different facets. And in law school, what may seem to be as more rigorous than getting the right answers is actually learning the process of legal reasoning, the how of getting to whether or not we have an intentional battery or a failure of contracting instead of merely the legal conclusions themselves instead of the right answers. Sometimes getting this across to my students is a hard sell, especially when we ourselves hide it from them. Hiding the ball, a tactic well known within the Socratic law professor's well-worn handbag of tricks. If done artfully, it can be emblematic of intellectual rigor and discovery. But if overdone, it can often lead to confusion, frustration, humiliation, and dread. In some ways, hiding the ball has become representative of the Socratic method or the worst of it. Um, but if done effectively, it can serve as a channeling function or a mediating principle or device that challenges our students effectively. We can teach better. So why not, from time to time, unhide that Socratic ball? There are ways of improving upon the current case method that allows our students to see there's more important concerns than getting the right answers, and that law school is often about process. Take, for instance, the way law schools often taught IRAC, um, that good old logic of critical thinking in American law, the baseline of legal reasoning. Um, mostly, traditionally, law schools just told students that this is what they need to use in order to deal with the law, especially in the first year when black letter played a much more prominent role. Simple, right? But this is what I used to see on law school exams from first years when I was teaching ac academic support. <laughs> Simple, right? And then when I asked the students exactly how they learned to do IRAC, they would just tell me, well, we were told to do this, but we really weren't shown how. It became very clear to me that there was value in being straightforward. If the basic level of legal reasoning is what will allow my students to get to the right answers, then it is my job to teach them this while I'm teaching them the predominant subject matters of my courses, whether that's contract law or something else. And this is particularly imperative in the age of the digital native and millennials, where our students come to us expecting feedback, expecting technology, expecting to learn just in time for our exams. Transparency is key. Oh no, don't get me wrong. I'm not a particular fan of some of the changes in modern life that I have that I believe have brought about the attributes in some of my current students. I'm not a particular fan, and I know I sound maybe like the faculty curmudgeon right now. Um, but granted, the, the, the solutions to those attributes is a discussion for another day. So the, the question is for now, what do I do? Well, it's all about the presentation. And the thing that I always go back to is to try to show my students the relevancy of whatever I'm trying to teach to them at the time. Adult learning theory says that students learn much better if they feel that they are uh, connected to the, to the subject matter in some ways that is, has some relevancy to them. So if my students are just-in-time learners, then making things relevant for them, uh, showing them why uh, learning the process of legal reasoning is much more important than getting to the, the right answers becomes very significant. In addition, educational theory, th theorists have posited something called the hidden curriculum. Basically, students will pick up by inference what is said implicitly about the way a program of legal education values certain concepts. So for instance, if a particular law curriculum uh, focuses exclusively on practice-oriented courses, then, th then students might actually think that theory and practice don't really matter at all, and vice versa. So armed with these theoretical insights, I went back to the drawing board in terms of teaching uh, legal reasoning. I, instead of waiting at the end of the semester to home in on thinking about legal issues and rule-to-fact analysis, I started at the very beginning of the semester. 
I explain to my students up front that, for me at least, the ground level of re legal reasoning is the R and the A of IRAC, and that it is their job to be able to master how to grasp the rules and graph them onto a set of facts in order to come to a legally relevant conclusion. Step one for an attorney. Without rules, we lawyers cannot make sense legally of the world. And without facts, the law is useless. It has no application. And from this introduction, I then muster every single moment I can in the law classroom in order to show my students how legal reasoning is done. In essence, why they're here in law school. I have revamped my own first year casebook, the one that I edited myself, uh, so that every single unit in the, in the contracts casebook um, is outlined in an IRAC fashion, so that students can see the importance of the structure in their case reading. So for instance, if we're covering consideration, the, the introduction of that chapter starts with a particular uh, preface to the issue, and then it follows with a section of rules that I've picked out and laid out for them from the restatement, bargain for exchange, so on and so forth. And then it falls with a group of cases that I've selected very carefully that demonstrate how the rule is applied to facts. And then lastly, it's followed with a section of, of problems that I've given to my students in order for them to be able to practice the law on their own. And my own lectures are also arranged in this IRAC fashion um, so that students can see face to face with me what the rules of consideration are, uh, how I want them to think about the rule, why do we even have the rule before we jump into the discussion of the cases that apply such rules to facts. My job as a teacher and as a scholar is to be able to model for my students how to think about the law, even if that means that sometimes I have to make the law accessible to them by, for instance, showing them how to read a complex statute or discussing the difference between a rule statement or a description of policy before we get into the cases themselves. And I can't do this well if I'm constantly hiding the ball. The difference between hiding the ball and being straightforward is that with the latter, my students can see very clearly through class discussions what's really relevant to them. Um, not the right answers, but what is the law here and how do we get to the right answer using the law. In other words, process. And for, so from nowadays when we're doing problems in my class, my students really know how things work. They know that they can't argue the facts with me and that they can't just give me the right answers. Instead, they must show me that they know what the rule is and know how to use it to get to the right answers. And they're very good now, because of this, at picking out both sides of the argument. Um, this also has really good implications for technology in the classroom because technology puts a premium on accessibility and relevance, which puts hiding the ball seemingly in a counterintuitive state. Uh, for example, or after all, uh, flipping the, cl the classroom is a great example of this pr the transparency. That uh, active learning, or excuse me, the, the video lecture style uh, uh, makes us as teachers be explicit and concise with our materials. And all of this also has very much uh, altruistic and self-serving purposes. When it comes time to take exams, my students will take a look at the, the, the process of being able to put law and fact together and find it much more secondhand, uh, than some, secondhand nature than something that they would have to pick up new. And here's this, the self-serving purpose. Being transparent leads to cleaner exams to grade, which leads to faster grading turnaround, <laughs> which gets me to the gates of the airport faster for, for my vacation. Need I say more? Finally, and more seriously, there are aspects in life in the law classroom that have been changing or ch chipping away at some of the deeply rooted methods of teaching for the learned profession, toppling the gilded pantheon of the American legal educational history. None so as dramatic as the students who sat in the lecture halls generations before and those who are with us today. Socio-political and economic reasons aside, or differences aside, um, they think differently, they learn differently. So why are we still clinging on to traditions of lecture that continually, increasingly disenfranchise them? We must be clearer with our presentation. If we aren't as transparent and as accessible with the legal knowledge that we impart on our students, then what may seem like intellectual rigor can end up having really the effect of disempowering our students from becoming effective legal thinkers.
It sends the message that perhaps the law is intangible or abstract or onerous. Instead of offering uh, something that, uh, that has uh, utility in pursuing justice. My students need to respect the law, but they should also know that they're instrumental in bringing law to life by knowing how to reason with it and knowing uh, how to practice it. We can teach much better. By uh, knowing, understanding what is relevant to our students and uh, bringing that out much more clearly in our teaching and sometimes stand out from behind the ball and chain of tradition. Thank you.